Um, I just wanted to start out by saying that, in fact, my background is as a mathematician, not a statistician. I got really excited about the opportunity to talk to people who weren't mathematicians um, about statistics. And I started with what was then called the Statistical Assessment Service. It then morphed into stats.org. And now we are simply stats at Sense About Science USA. And as Bob said, our mission, among other things, is to promote public understanding of numerical information. And I have been working with journalists for more than 10 years in improving communication about quantitative questions. And it has been in, in, in a, really, a really interesting journey for me. And if anything I've learned, it's just not simply math. So um, I thought I would start out by asking everybody what you think when you hear the word statistics. So as Bob said, there's this uh, address you can go to or you can scan the QR code that I put on the screen as well. And we're going to populate a word cloud. I think Desiree is going to throw that up so we can see what people think. What, what do you think of when you hear the word statistics? And I'll just wait a couple minutes for people to take a look at that, to enter their information. You can, you can put in something that someone's already put in if you like, but you can also put in something completely different. I have to say that for me, this is actually the most exciting part of the talk because I really want to know what people think of when they think of statistics. I've been thinking about it too long, so I no longer know what everybody else thinks. Um, but but I think it's kind of fun to know. You can put in more than one word if you like. We've got complicated, it seems like data and percentages are coming up in a big way, hypothesis, probability, precision, cherry picking the data, that's an interesting one. Measuring uncertainty. Uh, lots of really great answers here. So you can continue to, to put them in. <clears throat> you can continue to put your answers in. Um, however, I'm gonna go back to the, to the presentation and as you maybe we'll throw it at the end, we can get another look at that. So I'm gonna start by talking about polling. And, um, and so polling is like football for, for all of us, especially around the time of, of uh, every four years when we get an election. So I thought I'd throw up here um, a little chart that showed up in the New York Times that says it's presidential choice by first name. And I'm gonna ask you again to go ahead and put in your information as what's communicated here. I'm not gonna throw on yet just yet what you put in as your answer, but if you go there, you'll see it what's communicated here and what, what I'm gonna just talk you through a little bit as you make your decision to look at this chart and say, well, okay, it, it says it's talking about the 10 most common female names, the 10 most common male names and their voter preferences. So it tells us, for example, that among all the Richards who were uh, polled by the New York Times, 64% of them supported Trump and among all the Nancys, 57% uh, uh, supported Trump and 43 Biden. And down at the bottom, for example, you'll see that Karen only supported Trump, only 40% of Karens supported Trump, whereas 60% uh, of Bidens supported Trump. And so I am curious to know what you all think this tells us about the names. So go ahead and put in your, your answer. And then maybe Desiree, you wanna throw up <clears throat> what people said. So lots of people saying that there's something else not mentioned here that's what it's actually telling us or maybe nothing at all. Uh, I think that we have lots of people saying also that it's nothing at all, okay. Yeah, so it's kind of a cute one. Maybe it's nothing at all. All right, so I'm gonna throw us back to the presentation. All right, so I looked at this and I thought there was a big gender gap. 
This example is something we call a confounding factor. So we might think that we're measuring something about what people think. And I was particularly interested in this because when I first saw it, I thought, gee, you know, that, that, that percentage of people among, among Richards who support Trump was really disturbing here because it's pretty unlikely to take a sample of say 20, take 20 different samples of people with different names like this, and then just sort of see someone who had such strong favoritism towards Trump. And so I started to notice though that there's this big gender gap in who preferred, uh, who preferred Trump. And in fact, that's something that tells us something very different about what the poll is actually telling us, which is actually that Karen is female. So if we take a look at this gender difference and, and, and if we take a look at who supported Trump, who supported Biden, and we just list this by the people who were most in favor of Trump, the names of those people who are most in favor uh, that, that had a greatest uh, disproportionate number. Of course, what you see here on the left is that there are actually, um, where we look at the Trump supporters, there are actually very few names of women who support, uh, that have a large percentage of, of, of people of those names supporting Trump. So you see Janet here, we see Cheryl and Betty, but everybody else are male names. So it's predominantly male here in the list of those who had names that are strongly in favor of Trump. And on the right, we see the category of women's names appearing much more under those supporting Biden. We only see Patrick here and uh, Anthony down here. Of course, you could, as you might imagine, Donald's are, are supporting Trump. And, and maybe that has to do with his name, maybe not. I was pleased to see though that um, like Rebecca is actually prefer Biden um, over Trump. And as I, I um, as you might have surmised, they left out a lot of people who didn't have an opinion. So what they did was they just uh, listed those people as proportional to those, sorry, they only just listed those who had an opinion. So they, if you translate that, it turns out 63% in favor of Biden, which as you recall is even more favorable to, towards Biden than the Karens. Okay, so that's a kind of cute, cute example, but one of the things that comes up a lot in this story is a lot of misinformation. And I found this very interesting article by 538 saying how bad is the COVID-10 misinformation epidemic? So you might think if we're looking at something like this, we're saying we would have some measures of how bad that information, uh, the misinformation was. And in fact, what we what this was just an article simply about a survey saying that half of Americans, a little under half, actually thought that they had encountered some completely made up news. And it had very little at all to do with how much misinformation there actually was, but rather what people's perception about that misinformation is. So we're kind of left with asking whether we've actually had misinformation about misinformation. But there are lots of problems with surveys. And one of them is that the respondents may not be randomly selected. Here I've put up an example where we say, ask questions such as, do you favor reducing social security benefits? And you take a poll and you find out that if you don't include lots of people whose age is over 50, here we just have 20% of the people are over 50, you get a very large number of people who would favor reducing social security benefits. But if you include instead half people over 50 and half of the people were under 50 and ask them, you get much less support for favoring social security benefits. But it's not just about whether we randomly uh, select our participants, it's also about how we understand the questions that we ask. It's also about what the people who are being asked the questions uh, think of at the time. And there's something really contextual here. So I want to give you an example of a survey that was done in 2017 of college students. They were presented with uh, a scenario that a public university is inviting a controversial speaker to campus. And that controversial speaker is known for making offensive and hurtful statements. And then they are being asked, this, uh, the, uh, the people who are taking the survey, these are college students, though it was not very clear how randomly selected they were, but they were asked the following thing. If a student group opposed to the speaker disrupts the speech by loudly and repeatedly shouting, so the audience can't hear the speaker, do they agree or disagree that those students' actions were acceptable? 
And here they found a very large disparity between what Democrats thought, 62% agreed with it as being acceptable and 39% of Republicans agreed. Then the questionnaire asked, a student group opposed to the speaker uses violence to prevent the speaker from speaking. Do you agree or disagree and that, those, uh, that those actions by that group were acceptable? And a surprisingly large number of people, according to this survey, responded 20% of Democrats, 18% of Republicans, again, among college students who are responding to this, agreed. This is a very interesting case in which the person who conducted this study was actually is a fe senior fellow at, at the Brookings Institution, but it's also somebody who's actually not trained in polling, was a, a, is an electrical engineer. And it's not clear exactly what student group he had, but there was a tremendous influence. In fact, that poll was funded in part by the Koch Foundation. So the media response to this was, was really impressive. A chilling study shows how hostile college students are to free speech. A survey 20% of college students support using violence to shut down speakers. US, uh, so, uh, US students support violence shouting to stop free speech. And millennials are snowflakes and here are the data, here are the data prove it. So what we have here is a really important question as to how people are thinking with a survey that comes out saying that people are supporting violence to shout down speakers. And it certainly feeds into a certain point of view of how students are responding to questions of free speech when they feel uh, that their ideas are threatened on campus. But there's an important context to the study that I want to bring up, which is that about a week before that study, there was a group of white nationalists who marched to the University of Virginia insisting that they were there to preserve uh, some Confederate statues. And instead they were chanting racist slogans and got uh, and eventually drove a truck into a group of counter protesters and killed one. And that had happened just a week before, which makes you wonder whether the students were actually responding to the survey as it was written in the questions that we just heard or as they perceived its implication for hate speech on campus. Now the question didn't ask about hate speech explicitly, but it's really important, so important in fact, that there was another sur survey that was conducted. In fact, this survey, uh, unlike the previous one, was very clear about how they, uh, they established who it was who was responding to it. And they asked the question, if a guest, guest speaker with an ideas and opinions I strongly disagree with were invited to my college campus, I might use violent or disruptive actions to prevent the event from occurring. And only 1% of respondents said yes to this question. So perhaps they were less willing to take responsibility for other people's actions than they were for their own, but it's also possible that they truly misunderstood the context of the original question, which was that they didn't, uh, whether, whether they were, um, that, they, that they found that the person was offensive and thought of it as hate speech. And in fact, the question of saying, does the first amendment of the constitution protect hate speech? And here we have almost three quarters of students who, who thought maybe it does. Okay, so that is where they perhaps felt that it was more appropriate to respond in ways because they thought that they had no other recourse. Now, there's probably no greater place that people think of statistics when it comes to media than how we talk about medicine. So I thought I would um, take a look at um, some, some perfect examples of this. And it is one of the most influential places that math and statistics occur. I'm gonna start with just our visual picture. And I thought I would start with a few bad examples of visualizations of data. So many of you said data. Here are some data, they're presented in a graph. And you might notice on this graph that the, uh, across the top, we see the dates. And on the left-hand column, we see the number of cases. This is from Pike County in Georgia. And unfortunately, the graphs are going down, which suggests perhaps that the rate is going down of new cases, but in fact, the rates are going up. It's just that they put the numbers decreasing on the left-hand column. Here's another example of something also from Georgia, 
where it looks like over time, you see some decreasing number of cases among these different counties. But if you look really closely at that x-axis across the bottom here on this x-axis, you notice that actually the dates are mixed up. So you've got, for example, April 26 is occurring after May 4th. And these are possibly just mistakes possibly they were intending to deceive, but I think it's really easy to think about ways in which even when we don't intend to, to intend to deceive people, people get a little confused. So here's another example of something, which is, it, um, this one's in Texas, so I don't pick just on Georgia, in which they tracked the new cases that were happening, again, back in May, of different counties. And you'll notice here that on the y-axis, we have what's called a logarithmic scale where the numbers are going up, but they're not going up with the same amount of space. You'll notice that between 10 and 20, you have less space than you had between 20 and 30, for example. And so they've changed the scale here so that between 100 and 200, you have very little space, even though between zero and 100, we have this, this huge amount of space. And this, this idea of putting something on a different scale is really an important idea when we see exponential growth, but it also at the beginning of the, uh, of the um, epidemic, this, the, the, the pandemic, we have the problem that it looks as if our graphs are leveling off. It looks as if our curves are leveling off when in fact they're increasing quite a lot. And so this, in this case, perhaps it wasn't appropriate to put it on there. Now there's lots of representations of information and I wanted uh, that it's graphical. And I wanted to bring up another one that was popularly and widely viewed as being highly effective. In here we have two curves that are representing people's uh, cases. The number of cases is here on the left-hand column saying, and the left on the left axis and the Y axis saying that without protective measures, we would go over our healthcare system capacity. And with protective measures, we would stay under that, uh, under that uh, all important line of the healthcare system capacity. And on the one hand, this was enormously effective because people really understood the idea of flattening the curve that if we could, we could have fewer cases, oops, sorry, even over more time that we would not overwhelm the healthcare system. But the problem a little bit with this kind of graph is that it suggests two things. First of all, that somehow having cases is the same thing as employing the healthcare system. And that's not always the case. Of course, if we have a lot of cases of say young people, we may not overwhelm the healthcare system the same way if we have a lot of cases of older people. And the other issue, which really was very important for those people who are busy advocating that somehow we could get massive immunity by having massive exposure, that it suggests that the same number of people were going to be infected anyway, and we just may as well decide whether we're going to do it faster or slower. So instead with some students, I developed a different graph of the same thing. One where we talk about, again, now let's just talk about hospitalizations rather than cases. So we really are emphasizing that we're worrying about those people who we can afford to put into the hospital or not. And we could look at that at that part of the curve, but then we also emphasize that when we have a system that goes over that line of how many people we can put into the hospital at one time, and that we can treat them with the best medicine, that we end up with a lot more total death. So to, to communicate not just the seriousness of the illness, but are the number of infections or the seriousness of the infection, infection, but also the seriousness of actually having, uh, of actually dying. So of course, it's not just COVID that we use math for. And in fact, I wanna give an example in which a very simple mathematical idea, one that many of you saw in elementary school, plays an important role in understanding something as important as cancer. And this is a story about a particular drug called Perjata, which is used for late stage breast cancer patients. These are women who have breast cancer and are about to die, nothing else has worked and has perhaps metastasized and where um, they're in a last ditch situation. About this drug was written back in 2012, um, a series of news articles, Newsweek was not the only one saying essentially cancer breakthroughs cost too much and they do too little 
we should not necessarily be treating these women because they just cost so much, we don't have much benefit. And in fact, it went on to say, Projeda gives the average woman only about six months more time before her disease starts to stir again. So it's highly suggestive that this six months was just this average woman only getting six months more wasn't worth the cost involved. And it wasn't just news sources that were doing this. In fact, a group of oncologists wrote an op-ed for the New York Times saying exactly the same thing, that the recent therapies for these cancer treatments were not doing enough and the best of them only increased the lifespan by a median of six months. So this question of what the average woman is brings up um, a, a really basic statistical concept of what we mean by the word average. We have the median, which is this middle number. So if I put a list of numbers in order here, I can just take the middle number, in this case is 13. Or I can take the mean of a set of numbers, which is when I add up those numbers, and then I divide by the number of numbers. Now the median has this wonderful feature of not being sensitive to whether there's a data point that's far from the other one. So you can see here, I finished it off with a 148 versus a 21, and it doesn't change the median. Whereas the mean is very sensitive to outliers. So this is really important because, for example, if we're gonna talk about average wealth in the United States, we tend to talk about median rather than mean because if Bill Gates walks into the room, my salary actually doesn't go up much as I'd like it to. But what do we mean when we talk about the average woman, that Newsweek claim? Well, we mean a median increased lifespan. So let's state what that means. If we said there was a median increased life of six months, that means that half of women are dying within six months despite starting this drug, but half of them lived for more than six months. Well, let's put up some fake data. I just invented this data. I don't have the actual original data, but I have these dots representing the amount of time that the women had more for, thanks to the medication than they would have otherwise. And I put it on this graph like this. And what we found was that women who lived 6.1 more months, so that's past the six month mark, and women who live five or more years more, and those are considered cured, they actually have the same impact on the median, which is to say that the median increased lifespan actually tells us almost nothing about the drug's effectiveness for half of the women. And in fact, very interestingly, a couple of years after this happened, Projeda became a foundational part of the treatment for women with a certain genetic marker because in fact, it was a miracle drug for some women. And that's what the median would always miss. So looking at this question of mean and median and how we talked about average, we might wonder if we have a language problem because mean and median doesn't always mean typical. Significant is a word that you've probably heard bandied about and it doesn't necessarily mean that something's important. To talk about the effect of something in statistics doesn't mean that there was actually a cause and a resulting effect. In fact, if we don't define, we don't generally talk about our defining assumptions and what our models are. Specificity doesn't mean that we can expect a specific outcome. Error doesn't actually mean mistake. So all of these statistical terms are really confused with their meanings in English. Confidence in statistics doesn't mean anything about how you personally feel about it. And generally speaking, we opt not to discuss much about error other than sampling error. So I'm gonna talk about what I think of one of the most pernicious words that occurred in the COVID-19 world since that, since that happened of this word of peak and how it occurred in the media. Specifically, I'm gonna just throw a few quotes up here. Models indicate Georgia may have already passed COVID-19 peak. The University of Nebraska experts say that Nebraska may have reached coronavirus peak, though the governor was urging some caution. 
Ohio may have hit peak of COVID-19 cases this weekend. These were all from past April. Eight states where coronavirus have um, fallen more than 50% from their peaks and followed with the novel coronavirus outbreak appears to have passed its peak in at least eight states. So you might get the impression from this language, and I think a lot of people did this past spring, that the word peak was telling us we have a single peak. Everyone has, its, has their peak. Every community has a peak, peak, and we only need to wait for that peak to occur. And then it's just smooth sailing right after that, because after all, we hit our peak. Here's Idaho, new case count leveling off as Idaho reports only in 14, uh, Idaho reports of 1467 coronavirus cases. And specifically since April 11, the confirmed case count has increased by just 66 at its peak on April 2nd. Idaho reported 22 cases in a 222 cases in a single day. And we can see that peak right here, April 2nd, here's the peak, 222 cases. So we took a look um, with this, with some students of mine. Uh, we took a look and we created a little video to say, take, say what happened. Here's the peak six weeks into the pandemic in Idaho. And as time went on, eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks into the pandemic looked good, but then it started to increase again. And as it started to increase, we got to this higher second peak. And then we thought, well, maybe that was the new peak. And we could say that here we have the actual peak is right here, 26 weeks into the pandemic. And sure enough, that seems like a good idea, but time went on yet again. And we went 27 weeks and 28 weeks. And of course, we all know what started to happen now is that we have until last week when I had to finalize this video, 34 weeks into the pandemic, our original peak is this little puny thing here at the beginning, which just points out to us how naive we were to be talking about passing our peak. Okay, so what happens with a lot of these things, of course, is that data are, um, are really important for doing statistics and you all notice that as well. In fact, statistics go where data, data, statistics follow wherever data are going. Okay, so I thought I'd show an example of how this occurs. So there was a recent article in Nature talking about cell phone use and using the data of almost 100 million people last spring to, uh, to figure out where they were going, what they were doing, and how that was related to coronavirus spread. And in fact, they, they mapped this out for an, out, an hourly way, and then they applied some models, and they found um, certain points of interest, such as restaurants and religious establishments that were um, responsible for more of the infections. And it specifically, they looked at what they called super spreader points of interest. That's what they identified. And they are very careful in this article to explain what sort of data they had and what sort of data they didn't have. And in particular, they say they don't study child care services and elementary and secondary schools. Now, this is really important because when we don't have data, it means that we can't use these models to estimate what's going on, how much the spread is. It's just not part of the story. But the media response typically doesn't recognize that this is a limitation of the kind of data that they were using, but rather simply states as fact, restaurants and gyms were the super spreader sites when the pandemic began. The cell phone data revealed it to us. And in the small minority of places are going to account for the large majority of infections. The study suggests that the maximum, reducing the maximum occupancy, including restaurants, gyms, uh, and hotels can slow the spread of illness substantially. So it's not that schools are necessarily unsafe, but it's you might get the impression that the paper practically proved they were safe. But it, in fact, what they did was not address the issue at all. And that's where we think of when we say that we look under the lamplight. Where is the light? And that's where we look. 
it's always a, a joke. Usually it's a drunk youth looking for, for his keys under the lamplight. But that's a standard kind of statistical thing to know we're only looking at what it is that we can look for because we have the data for it. Now, a lot of you mentioned percentages. Percentages were this way of, um, um, percentages were uh, something really easy. So I'm gonna ask you a percentage question. I'm gonna set this up. This is a test for you all about specificity and sensitivity. And um, the context is this, we're gonna look at lie detector tests and some made up optimistic numbers about how effective they are at finding people who are lying and, 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 find, and telling truth, teller, truth tellers that they're actually tr telling the truth. So let's assume that we've got 90% of deceptive people are actually discovered. That's saying we have 90% sensitivity. 95% of people who are truth tellers actually pass the test. And the question I have for you to enter into the Slido is if you if we find out that someone failed a lie detector test, how likely is it that they are actually a liar? So we're not gonna throw up the, uh, the uh, in-time responses yet because we want you to be able to see that 90% chance of somebody who is a liar uh, to be discovered as a liar and a 95% chance of innocent people actually passing the test. And I'm gonna let everybody take a quick answer for that. I don't want Bob's opinion yet until, uh, but I, I'll ask it in a minute after, before we throw up the answers. So go ahead and answer in the Slido what you think it is. All right, so Bob, what did you what did you put in as your answer? Well, I don't think you can answer that unless you know the prevalence of liars yeah, in let's the population. Take that. That's an excellent answer. All right, so let's take a look at, Desiree, wanna throw up what we found? Great, so lots of people knew that, that we can't tell the answer. So very interestingly, this kind of question was asked to a group of uh, doctors dealing with um, breast cancer, and a huge percentage of them got that wrong and believed that there's in fact very small, they believed that there was actually a very high chance you could. In fact, they were given the additional information, which is how prevalent something is in the population. So what Bob says is absolutely right. We can't know unless we know what the prevalence is of liars in our full population. So let's just assume that 2% of government employees are deceptive and let's do a little calculation. So again, we're assuming 90% of the time the polygraph test is detecting the liar and 95% of the time it's detecting a truth teller. And so if someone failed it, let's see what happens. So let's assume that we have a thousand government employees, 20 of them are lying, 980 of them are telling the truth, right? So then we, that's a 2%. And of those 20 liars, 18 will be caught because we said 90% of the time we're gonna catch them. So that's 90%. Of the 980 honest folk, 49 will actually fail the polygraph test. And that is because that's the 5% of uh, these uh, false positives. And so if we look all together and we say, what's the total story that goes on, we had 67 people who failed the polygraph, but only 18 of them are liars. And that comes out with saying, okay, 73% of the people who failed the polygraph test are actually telling the truth. So I thought this was curious. I actually went and looked up what are the rates that we actually say in research, what, what, what is actually, what do people actually think are the rates of sensitivity and specificity? And they came out with something that was close to 90% of the time of detecting liars, but only in about 73% of the time detecting the truth tellers. So much less, uh, uh, um, much less specificity. And what that, what we came up with there was if you then run the same numbers as before, all of a sudden from the 980 folk, 265 are gonna fail the polygraph test. And of the total, when we put all those 283 people together, only 18 of them were actually liars, giving us that 94% of the people who are failing the polygraph test are truthful. 
Now you might say, okay, what does that tell us about say COVID? And I just thought I'd throw up a warning here. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. In fact, it doesn't tell you a lot when specificity is high. So that specificity is how likely we are to get to um, get get to the um, how likely we are to find out that if you are actually coming out, if you're actually negative, that you're going to test negative. Here we have high specificity. And if we run a similar kind of thing, we find that most everybody who is testing positive is in fact positive. Okay, so now I'm going to um, say something about like the real value of statistics to my mind, which is that it's going to help us decipher when it is that something is actually happening by chance and when we can feel relatively confident that at least it's worth thinking about when something isn't happening by chance. And this is why we care so much about, about statistics. Specifically, it, we need to understand what random behavior does. So a lot of statistics is about measuring what would happen if we were in a random situation where nothing was going on. And to that effect, I'm gonna give you a scenario where you might believe nothing is going on, but I'm gonna show you that maybe something is. So I have a magic penny and I flip it and it tells me who's gonna win for president. It worked this time, I flipped it and I got ahead for Democrats. It was in fact correct 15 out of this past 17 elections, which is really, really impressive. You should believe that my magic penny is in fact magic because there's only a 0.1% chance of that happening. And I'll tell you, I could publish in the best journals with that kind of result. So you should be very impressed. Now, of course, you knew it was a, pan, a penny. So you probably suspect that I'm some kind of charlatan, but I will tell you just a little bit about how I found my penny, which is that I, I went to a, a large lecture room. I took a thousand friends and I said, hey, everybody flip the penny 17 times, just pull out a penny, flip it 17 times and write down H and T each time. Then compare that to a list of correct presidents who won each time. And then I'm going to go through and say, let's just pick the best coin out of all of these. Now, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. And as you might suspect, that means that it's much more likely I'll have a penny that's magic the way this one was, instead of it being a 0.1% chance of getting 15 out of 17 of these previous elections. In fact, in a room of a thousand flippers, there's actually a 70% chance of finding such a magic coin. Now, why is this important? Because when it is that we do any kind of scientific work, such as trying to find, um, trying to prove that a vaccine works or that a medicine works, we have to be sure that this is something that's extremely unlikely to happen if it were only chance that we're working behind the scenes. We need to know how randomness works. Now to make sure that you really understand randomness, I'm gonna give you guys all a choice. I'm gonna look at two sets of 100 coin flips. And what I did here was one of these two sets of coin flips, I actually flipped it myself and I used, I just used a random number generator to be honest in Excel chart, I didn't bother to flip it, but I used a random number generator and it's truly random. And the other one I made it up thinking I'll fool you, I'm gonna come up with a list that looks awfully random. So I want you all to answer by looking here. Do you think which of these two is actually the one that was generated by a random number generator? So something truly random. And I'll encourage you before we show any results, feel free to put it in what you think. I'll encourage you to look at the patterns here that you might see in this list. And you might notice here, we've got HH, then TTTT, so there are four Ts in a row, then HH, and T, then HT, and H. Down here we had five Ts in a row, then HT, HT, three, four, five Hs in a row. As you keep thinking about it, I'm gonna actually show you a little flip data on this question of how many in a row that you had. So seeing one in a row, that's like when it's when HT, HT like that. And then two in a row here, we see a big difference. That choice A, which is in blue in front here, had a lot of twos in a row and choice B didn't have very many twos in a row. In fact, choice B had like an eight in a row. We can go back and see there's, there's eight in a row here. I think it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight Ts right here in a row. 
So that's what happened with choice B. And that's, that's what we see here in the chart. So I think probably you've got a lot of answers, Desiree. You wanna show us what it is that people said? So the B flips, the A, and some people saying you can't do better than a guess. That's interesting. What do you think, Bob? B for the win. You say B for the win? Because what you probably know is that it's not too unlikely actually to have a lot in a row. And of course we can't know with certainty, but well, I will say that it's much more likely that you'll see the sequence of 100, in 100 flips, that you'll see a, a run of like six heads or, or more in a row or six tails than that you wouldn't see it. Okay, so in fact, they even catch fraud by people making up things like that and being as silly as I was and as dumb as I was about randomness where you just simply say, well, I think that it's gonna look like this and not coming up with um, commonly seen things. So we're now getting towards the end and I could take a look at my favorite topic, which is causation and correlation. And you guys have all seen this. The idea is simply that if, you, if one thing causes another, you, 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 um, you, that's very different than just saying that they happened at the same time. And correlation is when they happen at the same time, but causation is when we know one thing caused another. So there's all sorts of spurious correlations. You'd love this website. It's fantastic where you can go and see all sorts of spurious correlations where we just kind of look at two things that are completely unrelated and put them on the same graph and say, look, they tend to track together. And that's what a correlation uh, does. But it's, you might think that it's pretty easy to tell through them. And I'm gonna go through some examples like height correlates with reading skills in children under 10. That seems very unlikely to be causal, much more likely that children are growing at the same time as they're learning how to read. Height correlates also with increased cancer. People are trying, still trying to figure out whether there's more cell reproduction or something that results in more cancer. Income correlates with success in college. And of course, that's a big discussion. Ratio of finger lengths correlates with aggression. Nobody really understands that. Some people have all sorts of theories behind that. Facebook correlates with poor grades, of course, because people are not doing their homework while they're busy online doing Facebook. But actually in a different study, they found that Facebook correlates with good grades because people are talking about their homework with their friends. Doing heroin correlates with doing marijuana. Big questions of the gateway drugs. Higher poverty rates correlate with high annual growth, uh, sorry, higher taxes correlate with high annual growth and it inversely co correlated with, with poverty. Alcoholism correlates with less gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, one that I think a lot of people believe is in fact uh, uh, causal. Okay, so, um, yeah. All right, so I think of this as a kind of moral and statistical collision because it's easy to think what's the difference between causal um, and uh, between a causal connection and a correlation when you have nothing invested in what the outcome is. But once you do, and that you have a moral and statistical collision. So I'll give you an example of the kind of thing that happens. We see that beer is highly correlated to uh, the sale of beer specifically seems to be related to gonorrhea. And in fact, you might may or may not believe the causal statement that taxes on beer reduces gonorrhea. Well, how do we get to something like this? Well, I'll tell you that what happened was a group of economists looked at gonorrhea rates and they saw that it skyrocketed from 1965 to 1975, going from 169.5 cases to, 100, to 461 per 100,000. The rate plummeted only in, uh, 20, by 20 years later, and it dropped a lot in specifically in 1990 to 1991, which was the same year as an excise tax was doubled. So people came to the only obvious conclusion. In fact, the CDC came out and said that 20 cents additional tax per six pack, which was four cents a beer, would cut youth gonorrhea by 9%. And it seems like an absurd statement, especially if you knew anything about what was going on. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a sexual revolution and people were just doing it more. And then guess what happened in the 1980s? 1990s is HIV and AIDS came, came about and people started really using condoms a lot. So in fact, it's very unlikely that this was causal, but it was promoted by even our Centers for Disease Control as something causal. 
And if you thought that that was just some kind of um, specific phenomenon back then, and people know better now, we do have taxes as a cure comes out all the time. Soda tax will prevent 26,000 premature deaths, the study finds. These studies are usually based on an economic model, hardly ever based on data. Taxes on alcohol reduce deaths by car accidents. Taxes on alcohol reduce suicide. And it's not that I'm an anti-tax person. In fact, I'm generally a pro-tax person, but the question is whether we're diverting attention for real problems that require serious public health policies by just saying, let's just collect some taxes and suddenly these problems will go away. So we get to all of this, we ask, what do we get from our full story here? We, we should get that numbers are like sources. We have to know where they're from and whether they're trustworthy. We need to know about strength and context of evidence. We need to trust our scientists and that a community of scientists should always be more convincing than science by a single scientist or an interested party, or for that matter, a politician. Data can hardly ever be summarized by a single number. We need to know about the spread of the data. We need to know about whether there are any confounding factors or other factors that can influence the outcomes. You can't rely on a story to make statistics. That's the N equals one. It's, um, they're typical, they're often not typical. And correlations are not causal in general. You need to be wary of your own biases. So what we come from this is that statistics don't provide truth, but they do provide evidence. So I'm gonna finish now with a short video. Um, it's in French, but it does have English subtitles and hopefully you'll find it enjoyable. Au Japon, on consomme peu de graisse et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux états unis En France, on consomme beaucoup de graisse et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux états unis En Inde, on boit peu de vin rouge et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux états unis En Espagne, on boit beaucoup de vin rouge et le nombre d'infarctus y est plus faible qu'aux états unis Au Brésil, on fait beaucoup plus l'amour qu'en Algérie et le nombre d'infarctus des deux pays est plus faible qu'aux états unis Conclusion, buvez, Mangez, faites l'amour autant que vous voulez. Ce qui peut tuer, c'est parler anglais. Great, thank you very much.